West Springfield High School's Applied History presents FCPS Through the Decades. Chapter 1, 1870 to 1900. Hello and welcome to the first episode of FCPS Through the Decades. My name is Eric Tannehill and I will be your host. I hold the prestigious position of temporary unpaid intern and in commemoration of Fairfax County Public Schools 150th anniversary, we've decided to make a podcast about the school system's history. This will be an educational and hopefully entertaining series where we examine significant decades in FCPS history and analyze how these events relate to a broader cultural and historical perspective. In this episode, we will talk about the founding of FCPS and its early years, the political complications of running a school system, the evolution of school buildings and the education system as a whole, how transportation technology affected schools, and the roots of segregation and racial discrimination in schools. For some modern context, as of 2019, in terms of population, Fairfax is the largest county in Virginia, with over 1,100,000 residents, a startling contrast for starting out with only 4,000 students in 1870. It is located just southwest of Washington, D.C. If someone commutes from the suburbs to work in D.C., they probably live here. The most well-known landmark is Mount Vernon, the estate of George Washington, first president of the United States. I've been to Mount Vernon, and I do recommend visiting once quarantine isn't quite as necessary for public safety. The tour is educational, the grounds are lovely, and it profoundly affected me, seeing the opulence of Washington's manor contrasted with the small slave quarters. While this podcast is going to focus on Fairfax County Public Schools, it's also useful to get a sense of Fairfax's history before the establishment of its school system. By American standards, Fairfax is pretty old, being founded in 1742 and named for Thomas the Sixth Lord Fairfax, whose land grant was used to establish farms in the Northern Virginia area. Originally a tobacco farming community, Fairfax County saw very little in the way of growth until the 20th century. As a Southern state, Virginia participated in chattel slavery, and as you can imagine, Fairfax was no exception. The Potomac River, which was used for the transportations of goods, including human beings, makes up Fairfax's eastern border, so it will be unsurprising to learn that slaves were bought, traded, and forced to do labor in this county. Despite its association with General George Washington, Fairfax actually wasn't a place where any battles took place during the American Revolutionary War in 1776. The most interesting thing that happened was a couple raids by Lord Dunmore's fleet along the Potomac, but apart from burning down a couple houses, the most Fairfax saw from the Revolution were shortages in goods. Ironically, one of the buildings that nearly got burned down was George Washington's house. After the Revolutionary War ended, a new constitution for the Commonwealth of Virginia was written by George Mason, a man native to Fairfax County. After the 13 colonies officially united and became their own sovereign state, no longer ruled by the British Empire, the slave trade continued to grow, becoming the basis for the South's economy. The reliance upon slave labor for farming cotton, the South's main export, led southern states to secede from the Union after the Republican Abraham Lincoln was elected as president, as he was a known abolitionist and a threat to their economies. Virginia in general saw many battles during the Civil War. As its northern border is shared with Maryland, a border state whose allegiance was maintained early in the war by the barrel of a gun. Fairfax's claim to fame during that war was being the site of the First and Second Battle of Bull Run. I could go into more detail about the nuances of Civil War strategy and each battle's body count and so on, but I don't feel like it, so I'm not gonna. Trust me, the Civil War is like the most well-documented war in U.S. history. You will be able to find things. TLDR, from 1861 to 1865, the South wanted to keep their slaves and fought a war they couldn't win because of it. They lost, leading to an end of chattel slavery in the United States with the passing of the 13th Amendment. Okay, with all the background information out of the way, how did FCPS come into existence? After the Confederacy's attempted revolt failed and the American Civil War came to an end, most Southern state governments had to reorganize themselves. To this end, Virginia adopted a new constitution known as the Underwood Constitution. Part of this new constitution was a mandate for the state to create a uniform and free educational system. Before 1870, children were taught at home, in private schools, or in schools run by churches. It wasn't until the Virginia General Assembly passed the Public Free School Act on July 11, 1870 that this changed. 
part of this public free school law required that schools be divided along racial lines, with schools explicitly meant for either white or African-American students. This can make it hard to see FCPS and Virginia in general in a good light. Luckily, that's not my job. I am under no obligation to make Fairfax County schools look good. The historical foundations of this school system are rooted in racism, and we can still see echoes of its effects in the modern day. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's for a different episode. Remember how I mentioned Fairfax County is big? Well, even in the 1800s, it was so big they decided to divide the county into six different sections or magisterial districts, each with its own school board. The school boards would meet to plan organizational matters like the distribution of funds, start and end a school year, etc. The school boards all reported to the same superintendent. Fun fact of the day. It turns out the public school tradition of procrastinating and throwing something together last minute is older than we originally thought. The first superintendent, Thomas Moore, was appointed September 18th, 1870, which left him about a month to establish an entire educational system. He did surprisingly well, given the limited amount of time. He used existing structures like churches, homes, rented rooms, old slave cabins, and buildings constructed hastily out of logs as schools. And at that point in history, a school could be run by one teacher, so hiring wasn't much of an issue. Of course, Moore was helped out by the pre-existence of some school buildings, an example of which were the Freedmen's Schools for African American Children. After the American Civil War drew to a close on March 3, 1865, the federal government established the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands to assist newly freed slaves. The Freedmen's Bureau, as it was more commonly known, issued food and clothing, provided health care and temporary housing, and established schools. In Fairfax County, the Freedmen's Bureau supplied funds and materials to build several schools for African American children. In 1870, the Freedmen's School in Vienna was folded into Fairfax County's public school system and came under the management of the school trustees of Providence District. We actually found an audio interview with William A. West that talked more about this. My father settled in Vienna in 1867. They made petition to the uh, Freedmen Bureau. They opened up the school for the colored in the old church. The schools then were numbered, the colored schools and the white schools were numbered numerically. This this colored school is number A. And we held it in the church that for until after Vienna was incorporated. Looking at primary resource documents confirms what West said about the alphanumeric system where white schools were numbered and African-American schools were labeled by letter. In the podcast notes, we'll link images, primary resource documents, and other interesting information if you want to check them out, including these documents. Hint, hint, if you're procrastinating on a project and you really need primary resource documents, use, use this. After one year, Superintendent Moore reported that there were 41 public schools in operation, 28 schools for white children, and 13 for African-American children. The disparity in the number of schools is very much indicative of the institutionalized racism of the time. Looking at the total student population by race and the number of schools available to each during the 19th century further demonstrates this chasm between white and black. Education wasn't compulsory before the 20th century, so out of approximately 4,000-ish children who were eligible to attend public school in the 19th century, only a small fraction, maybe 25 or 30 percent, actually did. As an interesting side note that isn't necessarily relevant, this is about the same percentage of children choosing to go to in-person learning as of March 2021 during the COVID pandemic. Regardless of the current day, a lot of the low attendance was economically driven because there were plenty of poor people who, regardless of skin color, had to stay home and work the farm in order for their families to, you know, survive. Looking at the numbers of children versus the numbers of schools throughout this era, it's plain to see that if you were poor and white, you still had a better chance of getting an education than if you were poor and black. Anywho, back to the superintendent. Thomas Moore resigned his position as superintendent after one year. The three superintendents that followed continued Moore's work of building schools, hiring teachers, and managing the six magisterial districts. They only served for a couple years before similarly quitting. Okay. Quit might not be completely accurate. This is mostly due to political issues. Before I start explaining the political landscape, it's important to mention that the ideologies of the Republican and Democrat parties are not the same today as they were 150 years ago. 
In the 1870s, the Republicans were the left-wing liberal party and the Democrats were the right-wing conservative party, many of whom wanted to preserve the ways of the old South, which is just saying they wanted to preserve white supremacy and continue to hold absolute power over black people. In the first few years after the Civil War, there were very few Southern Democrats who held any type of political office, meaning Republican, aka Northern politicians, held most of the power. As you can imagine, the majority of Virginians were Democrats and were not happy with this situation. The battle between Democrat and Republicans for control spilled over into education as well. This hit home for Fairfax County, which had more Republicans than other localities in Virginia. When the fourth FCPS superintendent, E. Frank Crocker, was appointed in 1883, originally from New York and a Republican, Crocker served in an acting role until 1886. I said acting because during that time he was never officially made superintendent by the State Board of Education in Richmond. They tried to appoint two other people in his place during that time, but those efforts were opposed and the men never served. I'm not going to lie, when I was looking into the history of the leadership of FCPS, I was not expecting to learn about Game of Thrones level political machinations and infighting. Okay. So, after the fourth superintendent, who wasn't technically a superintendent, but functioned as a superintendent, you know, Schrodinger superintendent, the county appointed and miraculously approved a fifth superintendent. Surprisingly, when the county actually hired someone qualified for the job who understood how schools worked, things started to actually improve. The fifth superintendent was appointed 1886. His name was Milton Dunley Hall, and he was the first superintendent to actually have any experience as a public school educator in Fairfax County. He started teaching in 1873 in a log school house in Centerville. During his time as superintendent, he made it a priority to modernize school buildings. This meant switching from essentially log cabins to wooden frame buildings. To get an idea of what they looked like, picture the iconic image of a little red schoolhouse. Okay, now imagine it is gray because the county was underfunding the schools and gray paint was cheaper than red. We were actually able to find an audio interview with Milton Dunley Hall's daughter, who recounts some of the issues her father had to deal with when it came to funding the schools. I helped him in, at home in his office work. I did quite a bit of typing. And uh, when he had to make out the reports for all the clerks of the school boards to submit to Richmond, he made out all the reports for the clerks of the school boards. They didn't seem to know how to handle that kind of work. He traveled by horse and buggy around the county. He visited every school in the county at least twice. He visited those schools and gave these uh, tests, all tests on arithmetic and spelling. And uh, all the, uh, the teachers knew him quite well. They called him the teacher's friend. He hired the teachers. He conducted the teacher's examinations. And if they did not have the proper mo enough money to pay the teachers of the county, he borrowed the money on his own. Yes, on his own. He just borrowed the money with, uh, course, with the mortgage on, uh, on uh, different properties that my mother had. I wish I could give a link for the entire interview, but it's not available online. In the rest of the interview, she talks about her time as a teacher in FCPS and more about her father's work. So... If you're interested in listening to this primary resource to gain a larger perspective and a more nuanced view, or being reminded that corporal punishment in schools wasn't always illegal, the full interview is in the archives of George Mason University. Anywho, by the early 20th century, nearly 100 frame schools had been constructed. It was also during the turn of the 20th century that the structure of the education system started transitioning to what we know it as today. In the 19th century, public school education consisted of grades 1 through 7, and all children ages 6 to 21 were eligible for a free public school education. However, as I mentioned earlier, school was not required during that period, so many boys stopped their schooling once they were old enough to work full-time on their family farm. Back then, schools were instead required to maintain a minimum average daily attendance number in order to remain, quote-unquote, in lawful operation. Schools that fell below this so-called lawful average might be closed for several months or for years on end or permanently. This diverse age range was all taught in one room by one teacher. It wasn't until the communities grew and one-room schoolhouses became significantly overcrowded that the county started creating multi-room schoolhouses with more than one teacher. Some of these schoolhouses were operated as graded schools or schools that divided grade levels into separate rooms. I know, novel concept. 
For instance, two-room schoolhouses had a room and teacher for grades 1 through 3 and another for grades 4 through 7. Three-room schoolhouses were subdivided further into grades 1 through 2, 3 through 4, and 5 through 7. If a graded school fell below the lawful average, they would temporarily close a room and consolidate the students back into one room. It is important to note that rural education among white and African-American schools of the county shared many similarities. Outhouses, well water, inadequate facilities. However, the one-room schoolhouses for African-American children remained in operation far longer than the ones for white children as much as two decades longer in some communities. By the early 20th century, white schools began operation in mid-September and went until early June. African-American schools began mid-October and went until mid-May. We know from oral histories that African-American families would pool their money and hire the teacher for an additional month or longer to extend the school year for their children. As the United States is a capitalistic society, it is very easy to see what the government does and does not prioritize by simply following the money. It is clear from historical ledgers that FCPS prioritized its white students and neglected its students of color. To this day, we still see issues, not just with Fairfax, but throughout the United States when it comes to educational inequality between races. But yet again, that's for a later episode. Apart from the evolution of schoolhouses, This period also saw the growth of trolleys. Fairfax County used to have three separate trolley lines. The introduction of the interurban trolley system at the turn of the 19th century had a significant impact on the public school system. The first of the three trolley lines began operating between Alexandria and Mount Vernon in 1892 and completed its expansion into Washington, D.C. in 1896. The trolley system made it possible for people in rural areas of the country to commute to jobs nearer or in the city. Over time, small communities formed around trolley stations. Fairfax County's trolley system led to the beginning of the consolidation era, a time when one-room schoolhouses were closed and students were moved into new, larger, multi-classroom buildings. A good example of this would be the effect that the creation of the McLean trolley station had on the schoolhouses in the villages of Langley and Lewinsville. As the community of McLean grew, due in large part to its trolley system, the schools of Langley and Lewinsville were closed and students were consolidated in a new two-story brick building in McLean that came to be known as the Franklin Sherman School. Similar consolidations happened elsewhere in the county, primarily in the 1930s, but the trolleys are what kick-started this modernization. In a broader context, the post-Civil War Reconstruction era saw many cultural and political changes. It marked the start of segregation and the beginnings of Jim Crow laws being put into place in southern states. While we're looking specifically at FCPS's history, it's important to analyze it and see how it's indicative of the overall sociopolitical landscape of the time. The most obvious is the rampant racism in southern states and how it affected policy. However, my favorite is to look at the evolution of the cultural view of education. I'm really glad that we've moved away from the notion that good quality higher education is reserved for the upper class and that the poor and working class can't afford knowledge to improve their economic circumstances. Yeah, we live in a much more enlightened era where necessary education isn't prohibitively expensive. Anyways, (laughs) thank you for listening to the first episode of FCPS Through the Decades. I hope you continue listening. Next episode, we got to hear about FCPS's involvement in an infomercial and explosions. That's all for today, but we have attached all sorts of information in the episode description if you want to learn more about anything I have talked about. This episode of FCPS Through the Decades was written and directed by Eric Tenhill, with script editing by Tara Whipke and Jeff Clark, and sound editing and visual art by Tara Whipke. For more information, go to fcps.edu and search using the keywords, Our History.